am a Global Innovation Fellow at CCIT. It's my honor to be the MC for this session and for the audience who have joined us. Um, I would like to give a brief introduction what MedCheck is about. Launched back in 2021, 15 co-authors came up with the clever ways of hacking healthcare or other problems to create sustainable solutions. MedCheck is about changing mindsets from academic to entrepreneurial alliance, from systemic to individual efforts or vice versa. The book is intended for students or of healthcare or other disciplines interested in healthcare related innovation, creativity and entrepreneurship. In correlation, MedJack webinar series is dedicated to uncovering the untapped potential of ICE, which is innovation, creativity and entrepreneurship within the realm of healthcare and beyond. Um, by bringing together like-minded individuals, this series aims to eliminate new possibilities and expand horizons in areas previously unexplored. It transforms each chapter of a book into captivating dialogues with the guests, innovators, creators, entrepreneurs, researchers, and educators. Proceeding to initiate the conversation, I would like to introduce um, uh, the moderator, uh, esteemed moderator for the session, Dr. Asad Mia, an ER physician by profession and a co-author, blogger, innovator, creativist by heart, thoroughly into, into, into innovation and training mindsets to think out of the box. Uh, let us welcome our distinguished guest for the webinar, Dr. Stephen Gaudi. Dr. Gaudi stands at the intersection of medical expertise and entrepreneurial spirit, embodying a unique fusion of clinical leadership and innovative vision. Serving as the Vice Chair of Research in Otolaryngology and Chief Medical Officer of Dr. Newsbest, Dr. Gaudi brings a wealth of experience and insights into the challenges and opportunities that lie at the nexus of healthcare and entrepreneurship. What sets, Dr. what sets Dr. Gaudi apart is not just his clinical expertise, but also his role as co-founder of the Emory Innovation Certificate Program. This program, under his guidance, is designed to cultivate and enhance entrepreneurial skills among faculty and staff, equipping them with the acumen to navigate the complex landscape of bringing cutting-edge technologies to the market. Uh, in this webinar, we will delve into the profound insights that Dr. Stephen Gowdy brings to the table. Join us as we unravel the dynamic interplay between medicine and entrepreneurship, exploring the challenges, space, and opportunities seized in the pursuit of advancing healthcare on the global scale. So welcome to everybody. Let's start with the conversation. Very great. Okay, it's my turn to go, I suppose. Uh, thank you, Eamon. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, Eamon is one of our Global Innovation Fellows, and so Steve, as you, uh, the, the chapter that we picked for this particular conversation um, is uh, in the Innovation Fellowship, and uh, Eamon and uh, I've got uh, one or two other fellows online, um, they represent the fourth iteration of our Global uh, of our Innovation Fellowship, which this year we <clears throat> uh, worked around global innovation, and in the previous iterations, it was health innovation. Um, that becomes part of a conversation. But um, before all of that, thank you. Um, really, really grateful for uh, having you um, this evening for us. It's well, it's nighttime for us. It's morning for you. Um, and um, so, Eamon has introduced you. Um, I'll, I'll kind of ask you, perhaps periodically during this conversation, to tell us bits and pieces. Or we'll probe your bio further because that becomes um, really relevant to the conversation. Um, for those people, I guess uh, we'll have more people joining. And if people are not familiar, Medjack, the book that Eamon uh, mentioned that the webinar series is around, I don't know if you can see this, but, but this, this is the print copy. Uh, I don't know whether I gave you a print copy of the book, uh, Stephen, but um, so each chapter becomes uh, an interesting conversation starter. And we try to um, invite uh, our guests or panelists to um, have done uh, interesting, really interesting work uh, that is relevant to what we are doing, um, and it's global, uh, globally relevant in in um, certain ways. So, without further ado, what my first question, uh, Stephen, for you is um, just thinking about the innovation, the the Emory Innovation Certification Program, which I don't know much about. Perhaps um, you could kind of. Tell us a bit more about it because you're one of the co-founders of it and then make it relevant to this particular webinar session by comparing it to the innovation fellowship that the chapter was about and uh, you know maybe you saw some um, similarities you saw some differences um, 
I know it's like a very packed question, but maybe you could just tease it apart and then I can also kind of remind you bits and pieces of that. Let's let's begin there. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. It's good to see and talk to everybody uh, and you know, bring the innovators and entrepreneurs of the world closer together. So the Emory Innovation Certificate Program really is born out of a desire to create a framework through which folks at Emory, uh, we had almost 100 people that applied to get into the program. We were only able to let about a quarter of those in. So there's a, there's a pent up demand or desire for people to understand how to be entrepreneurial, how to innovate and what that looks like. And, and so I think the similarities between what you're doing, uh, the fact that you have a fourth cohort of people that want to innovate and want to learn um, how to bring uh, innovation into the world uh, to impact care across the world demonstrates the same thing that we're finding here, that there are people that want to impact and change the way that they see things being done, but they just don't have the framework. They don't have the vocabulary that other folks do, particularly in healthcare. I mean, being able to provide differentiated, improved healthcare to people uh, and also, you know, commercialize it and learn something, maybe monetize it, you know, is, is a virtuous cycle. So the purpose of the Emory Certificate Program is, you know, it's a, it's an entrepreneurial journey in and of itself. So with setting up your, your fellowship there, I mean, I didn't know that if anybody would buy it or not, I, I assumed I, you know, I had hypotheses uh, that there was this pent up demand and need for it based on my own journey, right? The customer journey is one of the most important things to acknowledge. And, and based on my journey, navigating uh, healthcare innovation, and entrepreneurship, suggested to me that there was a need, an unmet need in the environment. So that's what we're trying to address with our program. I think it's what you're already successfully addressing with your program uh, and, you know, measuring the outputs of, of your program and my program will be uh, the foundation of improving and iterating that um, as we go forward. So I don't know if I answered all of your questions, but that's uh, my thoughts so far thanks for that so yeah that's a great start um so we we will we'll get into bits and pieces of that um so for those of you who are joining um uh, the way we want to do this is we want to keep this really interactive and so um steven and i don't have to keep talking but if there if there are any um questions or comments uh, please feel free to uh add that to the chat space or you can just uh, interrupt the conversation we want to keep this really interactive okay um so so steve um as uh, as as you thought about like you know, so so you so you identified a gap and then you kind of went about building up this innovation certification program and is it specifically for physicians or is it so that's that's perhaps a, a difference between our innovation programming over here uh, the certification that we've done and tell us a bit more about the duration is it uh, how long is it and and uh, maybe um, uh, you know bits and uh, bits around that. Right. So again, this is the first year we've done it. So, you know, I am, uh, I'm growth minded. So I want everybody to be included. Uh, we did not have the budget to, to, to feed and support, you know, a hundred people in the room. Uh, so we had to, to narrow the scope just to predominantly physicians or faculty uh, at the beginning. But my hope is that we'll be able to get other allied health members or members of the of the Emory ecosystem involved in this because I think each of us sees the problems and the gaps from a different lens. Uh, it's a 12-month program, 10 total sessions, uh, and it walks people through the funnel of innovation. So ideation, you know, identifying the gap, uh, developing a market size, thinking about intellectual property, uh, developing you know, uh, a refined idea, a minimal viable product or service, and, you know, then pitching it. So by the end of the program, they they will be working in teams uh, to come up with a single 
idea, product, service, what have you, that they will pitch at the end of the program so that they have gone through each step of the innovation uh, pipeline, if you will. And, and so I think that not everybody is well suited to bring a product service to commercialization. That's just not, you know, there's a lot of barriers. There's a lot of risk. There's a lot of frustration. However, that doesn't mean that you can't create things and, you know, license them or, you know, identify people that will continue to, to carry them forward and that you will improve healthcare and develop value for the consumer as well as for, for yourself or for your employer. Yeah, that, that, that really resonates with me as well. Um, so the way we've kind of done these things is that uh, we started off within the healthcare space and then we quickly find, realized that um, there's a lot of appetite in, in non-physicians or like well, when we went to the physicians or the, or the faculty per se, there wasn't a whole lot of interest. The medical students showed us much more interest and then the nursing students even more. So we've got a school of nursing and go to medical school, we go to school of education, and more recently, we started a faculty of arts and sciences. So we've done this very interdisciplinary or sector agnostic approach. Um, anybody who's interested, but and then there, um, our innovation programming or the fellowship is is for anyone who's interested in a one year experience of uh, of exploring um, health innovation, at least in the previous iterations, and then it's global innovation. And we're looking at um, improving. Uh, improving the human experience, let's say, let's, I'm just kind of putting it really broadly. So yeah, so there are a lot of synergies, a lot of interesting uh, similarities and differences. Um, let me let me kind of like um, get into a bit more about, from your perspective, uh, perhaps from based on your own experience, do you think the individuals, even physicians um, or medical students, let's say if, if somebody is more interested in just innovation, not necessarily in taking that, process further towards entrepreneurship or commercialization going taking it to market what would you say to someone even if it's if it's a faculty member or it's a student doesn't matter if they just want to be more creative and innovative and don't necessarily have the have the appetite to um, take the startup further yeah um i i would say i encourage you to do that um if if you're interested in innovation but not commercialization, then it's gonna be it's gonna be a hobby. It's gonna be for you. It's like learning to play the piano, learning how to paint. You know, it will live on your wall or in your drawer or wherever, but it's not gonna see the light of day. Uh, more than likely, just because you know, if you want to change the way that the world works, you have to understand value creation and set it set things in motion towards uh, you know saving money providing delight you know improving outcomes whatever that is and that ha that is all done through de-risking and in entrepreneurial development it doesn't have to be you you know you can be innovative you can license you know create the intellectual property go to your office of tech transfer or wherever you know whoever you work with or work for and then they can commercialize it. You know, there are people that are, you know, that are not good innovators, right? Like from our company, Dr. Knows Best, I innovated it. I came up with the idea. We brought it to market. We got traction. And then I realized I'm not the best person to carry this forward. So we hired a CEO, right? And that was good for me because that's her, her strength. That's her sweet spot is scaling companies. And now I don't have to, you know, do things that I'm not good at. So it's kind of recognizing what your strengths and weaknesses are. And if you have a strong desire to change the way that our world works, right? The, the way that we either avoid pain, cure disease, or bring joy, then, you know, figure out what your role is. How do you do it better than anybody else? And then, you know, pass it off to somebody else in that ecosystem that can help push it forward. You know, and there's a lot of ideas that die. 95% of startups fail, right? So it's not, uh, and I think that's the issue in healthcare and medicine is that people are not comfortable with failure. 
they see that as something to be embarrassed or shy or that, you know, that they got an F on a test and it's, it's, it's the worst thing that could happen to them. I mean, I think that if you see a gap, the first idea that you have won't necessarily be the idea that ends up addressing that problem, you know? And so pivoting and failing and pivoting and failing is something that's a little bit far into healthcare or health innovation. Um, and so that, I think that's one of the other things that, uh, that you need to recognize. Excellent. Yeah. So you've brought up a lot of interesting, really important points as well. So failing, pivoting, right? Fail, fail fast and pivot. And, um, and then uh, you mentioned that including somebody else who's better at perhaps doing the commercialization or tech transfer bit and, and to getting in touch with the right folks and including somebody who can take, who could take it uh, towards, uh, uh, you know, Going, taking it to market and so on. So um, I got like, I guess, a few medical students, perhaps I'm, I'm assuming, but um, like I said earlier, student, whoever is on this call, if you're interested in asking Steve something, just put put your question or comment in the chat space and, and I'll interrupt and we'll, we'll address your question or comment first. Um, so um, tell us, you mentioned uh, Dr. Knows Best and you know we, we came across this. Uh, I haven't looked it up. Uh, what what it's about? Tell us tell us about it. Tell us about the journey. Sure. So my background is I'm a pediatric ear, nose, and throat doctor or surgeon. So you know I pick boogers and earwax for a living, uh, and I have three kids of my own. And so nasal congestion. You know, you being a pediatric ER doctor, you know, like if these kids get RSV, or respiratory syncytial virus, they get really just lots of phlegm, lots of mucus. They can't breathe. They can't eat. They can't sleep. They get dehydrated. And most of the time you're admitting them to the hospital is just for nasal suctioning so they can breathe and eat. And so Dr. Knows Best is a company focused on upper respiratory health and wellness uh, that I founded some years ago and working with a group of students, kind of like the folks that are on this call, iterated and developed a portable rechargeable nasal suction device for babies. That's now, you know, so instead of them being stuck in the hospital or whatever, they can go home and suction their baby's noses at home. Um, and so it was it was just addressing a, a pretty straightforward pain point, right? Like nasal aspiration in children had not evolved. You know, we pay a thousand dollars for an iPhone, right? And we're willing to pay, you know, parents' willingness to pay is very, very high and you know, to take care of their babies. And so we addressed or met that need, you know, and the, the first iteration of the device that came up with looks nothing like what we are selling commercially today. Um, but, you know, we've, we've had growth, you know, significant growth over the last uh, three years, and we are bringing another several products to the market, you know, staying focused in that niche. So people, you know, on entrepreneurial podcasts say the riches are in the niches or the niches. So really finding a finite problem that you are the best to solve, right? For me, as a pediatric ENT surgeon, I deal with boogers all the time. I understand babies breathing, you know, respiratory congestion, sinuses, all that stuff. So that's my niche, you know, and I can leverage my network to uh, spread the idea, the the solution to other key opinion leaders uh, to, you know, create a new standard of care um, and and resist change. I mean, change resistance is very high everywhere, but certainly very high uh, in medicine. So that's another barrier that you have to think of when addressing, you know, a, a problem that you want to solve and make better. All right. Excellent. Right. So that's really interesting. Um, thank you for telling us about Dr. Knows Best. And so um, important points that you've raised. Uh, so I, I guess if I were to like summarize um, empathizing with, 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 with a, you know, if you empathize with yourself, you empathize with your kids, um, that became the starting point for um, you identify the, the problem and, um, and then you know, iterate upon the solutions of prototyping, testing, iterating, human-centered design thinking, that's what comes to mind, right? Because we've been uh, yeah. We've been delving a lot into human-centered design thinking through the Innovation Fellowship as well. And uh, my Innovation Fellows, their, their capstone project at the year, at the end of the year, the deliverable is a, is a capstone um, project that uh, report that 
um, uh, that has to be structured around human-centered design thinking. Um, so, so you you've kind of um, emphasized uh, uh, a lot of those points as well, and um, it's 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 really um, great to know. So, so tell me a bit of the challenges that you might have faced, or you probably are facing as as a faculty member at Emory. Um, you're a surgeon, and you've come up with um, uh, a startup. Um, does does the organization support? Um, your like so in terms of like conflict of interest, intellectual property, IP rights, and so what happens with you as a faculty member? And perhaps because we have students on this call, tell us a bit if you know um, if there's medical students who are creating something while they're students at Emory. Um, what uh, do they do? They have IP rights um, or um, you know something along those lines. Right. So I would say first to deal with the, the question around students. I mean, so students, because they're paying their own way here, at least in the United States, they own their own intellectual property. So they don't, they're not an employed person. They're actually paying to be there. So, you know, here, if I'm working with students, I have to be very clear about ownership of the intellectual property. And, you know, that was, you know, one of many things you know, for people that are in nursing school or medical school, you're never going to have a lecture on intellectual property. So, you know, again, all of this is a foreign language and you have to kind of learn it as you go. And most of the time that you're learning as you go, you're making mistakes. Uh, so that was my journey as a faculty member trying to innovate and be entrepreneurial. There was a lot of complexity and things that didn't make sense to me. Um, students, have a different relationship. And so you need to be also clear with a faculty member or other students you're working with about how that intellectual property uh, is being created and what the ownership structure looks like and so on. Just remembering that 100% of nothing is still nothing, whereas 5% of a billion dollars is still a ton of money. So, you know, I think at least there's TV shows and other things that, you know, paint this picture of, these young uh, people fighting over, you know, shares of companies and so on and so forth. And that really happens, but a lot of that can be avoided just by simple conversations on the front end. Uh, as it relates to Emory and startups, um, you know, I, I think you have to think about what are the incentives of the people you're dealing with and how are they viewed, you know, from a metric standpoint. So, an office of tech transfer employee, you know, really is not rewarded or not incented to help you commercialize the fastest or help you get your get your money or make it easy for you. They're they're really incented differently most of the time in that they're you know they don't want to negotiate or give something away that ends up making somebody else a bunch of money, you know, or giving away intellectual property or what have you. So. And they're usually understaffed. Uh, it's a lot of turnover, a lot of follow up, a lot of, you know, they have to deal with a lot of things on their plate. So being persistent, meeting with them in person, trying to understand with the individual university's intellectual property perspective is important. Uh, and then conflict of interest. I mean, you know, people think, oh, that's bad. I mean, conflict, people don't like conflict. Conflict is good. I want all of my faculty members to have lots of conflict of interest because that means that they're changing, they're being asked or considered to help commercialize things or they're commercializing things. And so even though it sounds bad, it's actually a very good thing. Uh, you, you know, you just have to be very thoughtful and careful about how you do it and not use the resources at your institution to work on your company project, product, what have you, because then they'll get ownership of that. Uh, in, in theory, it, it all should be aligned, but, you know, dealing with lawyers and all that stuff is very expensive. So you want to try to iron things out as much as you can on the front end. So that's, that's great to know. So um, um, how did you like uh, learn about uh, a lot of these things like tech transfer or commercialization aspects? Um, you 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 got an MBA, uh, but does that uh, get you enough knowledge or information about 
commercialization aspects as well or entrepreneurship? Or would you recommend that people who are serious about, or doctors who are serious about becoming entrepreneurs, should, should they be um, pers uh, pursuing an additional degree in entrepreneurship, uh, um, medical entrepreneurship, medical innovation? Uh, what, what, what kind of like trajectory do you suggest? And you can, you can use your really... own experience. Yeah, well, I would say it really depends on where your interests lie, right? If your interests lie on uh, innovation and developing new ideas and products and kind of human-centered design thinking, <clears throat> but you don't have any interest in commercialization or scaling or what have you, then maybe maybe doing an innovation you know, pro, you know, year program where it's really focused on ideation development you know but maybe not taking it all the way to commercialization might be good you know uh or if you're like look i want to understand mechanistically the finance part of things um you know because most of us in healthcare haven't taken accounting haven't taken finance those kinds of things you know then i think uh an mba or some version therein to help you understand things uh is helpful um but it's additional time and expense right and so if uh, if, if that's not you know if it doesn't fit in your life uh like i waited until my kids were a little bit older and you know would sit at my kitchen table trying to figure out statistics and you know my son was in high school taking the same statistics and so it was a little bit of family time there but you know uh there's a you know you only have a finite amount of time on this earth. So you have to decide how you want to spend it and where you're going to get the most value. And, and it may be hard to know. So, you know, again, uh, mentorship, right. Finding people around you in your environment, you know, or around the world that have done things that you're like, Hey, I'm interested in doing those things. I, I should talk, you know, to different people about how they've structured their life and how they've gone about, you know, getting the skills they need. There's because there's plenty of entrepreneur, very successful entrepreneurs, you know, like Bill Gates and you know Steve Jobs. I mean, they dropped out of college. They never finished college. So you can get on the job training for this, and or surround yourself with really good people. But you know, a lot of that uh, is is a little bit of luck and a little bit of work. You know, and that's on top of doing your day job of being a medical student or a nurse or a physician or what have you. So lots great. of things to uh, think about. Yeah. The, those are, those are great points. Uh, mentorship. Um, uh, I'm going to reinforce yeah, the, the importance of mentorship for innovation and entrepreneurship. So um, completely in sync with you regarding that. Okay. So there's a question here. How has Dr. Gaudi's work in countries like Guatemala and the Philippines affected his view on healthcare equity and how does he plan to address these challenges? Ooh, so. Yeah. How are you going to like, uh, solve the problem of uh, disparity in health <laughs> and lack of access? Yeah, I, don't, I mean, there's not, obviously, if there was an easy solution, people would have done it. Um, you know, I would say fundamentally, healthcare delivery in countries is really dependent on their GDP and their structure of government. So uh, I would say, I would not look to the US as a model uh, for health care delivery necessarily in that we spend a ton of money on healthcare and the health of our nation is not necessarily correlative to that. Uh, however, being in the Philippines, being in Guatemala or some of these other places um, helps me um, identify with the folks that are there. I mean, from a personal standpoint, I mean, I teach and go and do you know, surgeries for free and that kind of stuff, um, which again, there's a lot of debate about the, the surgical, you know, the provision of surgical care in, in developing countries. But that those are the ways that I feel like I'm helping uh, and keep me in touch with those folks. Um, as it relates to changing the healthcare infrastructure in different countries, that's far beyond my uh, my area of expertise. You know, I would say I think about how to bring the innovations that we're uh, creating 
uh, into those those communities as an adjunct. Um, I'm not, you know, and again, you know, people that in in low and middle income countries, honestly, if you compare the, you know, from an MPH standpoint, like the adjusted quality adjusted life years, I mean, clean water is going to win the day every time. You know, if you look at the infra, you know, cost and the return on investment, but you know, can I innovate around uh, nasal aspiration, nasal suction devices for low and middle income countries? I mean, yeah, I think that's the way we're moving. But again, to look at it from a business standpoint, you know, even Mother Teresa said, "If there's no margin, there's no mission." So I, I don't know. I'm not smart enough to figure out how to bring a lot of these solutions to low and middle income countries, but I continue to work alongside these folks and share what I'm doing and figure out how the, it may be repurposed in those environments with people, you know, kind of, again, surrounding yourself with people that better understand the problems that need to be solved, having them help iterate where, where we go from where we are. Those are, those are great points. Thank you. Thank you so much. Because those are really inspiring points as well, right? So I hope the folks on 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 this call they they um they realize uh, and they can also acknowledge um the work that you're doing. It is important work. So um I, and, and that's a great question that uh, that was asked because I think I'm I can I can potentially like kind of um build up on that and and ask you uh, questions uh, that are based on global health, let's say, right? So like, do you think in your experience or in, in the work that you're doing or what you're seeing and what's happening at Emory, do you think innovation, um, health-related innovation, entrepreneurship can address challenges that are um, uh, of a global health nature, first of all? Uh, so that's one question. And then, uh, yeah, let's just start off over there and then I can ask yeah. you another one. I think it really depends on the perspective of the people that are, that are, do, or performing the innovation and and thinking about it right so if they are somebody that grew up in the u.s and don't have that perspective of a, a low or middle income country i think it's less likely however you know if there are people nurses doctors whomever that have that perspective and they can see the dualities then and, and that's their passion right i mean entrepreneurship is is really a hundred percent about a an unrealistic passion to see something in the in the world that doesn't exist today and so either they have spent a lot of time in those environments or they they're you know originally from those environments i think that will drive solutions to to the low and middle income countries of the world um I would say just meeting with people in this environment, you know, most people that are entrepreneurs are serial entrepreneurs. So they're going to come up with, you know, again, you're going to have to fail a lot. Um, so you're going to have a lot of ideas and some of, you know, many of them are not going to be good, but, you know, uh, capitalizing on the ones that are good, that can get traction, that can be commercialized, meaning that there's value created uh you know because if there's not value created on any side or on all if it's not if there's not value created on all sides then it's probably not going to happen so you know that requires a specific expertise particularly for low and middle income countries to understand how is the value creation occurring and how is it going to you know what's it going to replace how is each step in the value chain going to be rewarded to bring it to fruition. Otherwise it'll die on the vine. So I, I don't know. I mean, Emory is a very global university and we have relationships across the world. So I don't doubt that, that there will be uh, a fostering of innovation by the, the different community, you know, communities and members of Emory across the world, but we'll, will we necessarily develop as a faculty, the, the best new solution for, health innovation in a low and middle income country? Probably not, but we can certainly help facilitate that and support it and, you know, collaborate on that. But I, again, I think the best people to, to do and perform these innovations are sitting in those environments and understanding what the barriers are. Oh yeah, excellent point. Um, excellent point, right? So, um, 
Um, I guess we are going. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so I have a question. Um, so okay. you just mentioned yeah. that. Uh, so being associated to a healthcare, uh, base, um, sorry, healthcare profession and into an impactful entrepreneurship already what is your casual observation for the fusion of innovation like what is the trend do you, that you usually observe the, that it's from hic to lmic or vice versa like what what's the uh, innovation impact that you usually see in 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 that right so but help me understand you said it going from one place to another. What were the two places? Uh, from uh, high income countries to LMICs or oh. vice versa. Yeah. Oh. Um. I don't. I don't know. I mean, I would say that the my and again, this is a guess. I have no idea. <laughs> my guess is that it's going to go from a, a a high income country mm -hmm. because. You know, if you think about the, you know, for bad, for bad or good, the universe, the United States of America has a high amount of innovation and entrepreneurship, right? And the reason being is that people can make absurd amount of money, right? Selling drugs, coming up with products, whatever it is, particularly in the healthcare space. Um, whether that's right or wrong, very, that's very political, a lot of things. But that's where a lot of innovation and in, in entrepreneurship happens because people can make a ton of money, right? And if you think about the value chain, like to bring anything to market takes a ton of money, particularly a medical device or a drug, you know, that's tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. And, the, and most people don't have 10 million or $100 million in their pocket to bring it to market. So they have to get investors, you know, who want a 5x or 10x return on their money, right? And so... I would imagine that a lot of the innovation comes from that and that, you know, either once, once it become, you know, becomes generic or, and, or, you know, the low and middle income countries are like, Hey, I know I can do this, you know, and we can create the same solution, but do it 10 times cheaper because our labor costs are lower. Our product costs are lower you know, we don't have the regulatory hurdles or burdens that, you know, the FDA and so on. I would say that that would be a lot of it potentially just because that's where the value is created. However, I, I am, I am sure that there are plenty of innovative devices that come out of low and middle income countries that are solving problems that, that we don't really have uh, in the high income countries, because we're willing to pay a, a ton of money for other solutions, even if it's comparable. Right. And so, you know, I don't doubt that there can be horizontal, you know, uh, entrepreneurship towards other low and middle income countries uh, and and create a lot of value. You know, and sometimes those are going to pop into uh, into the U.S. Um, and other places, but also just from a regulatory standpoint. If you're not generating patents, if you're, you know, and again, it gets to intellectual property, right? If you're not generating and submitting patents in the U.S., like say you come up, you you on your couch tonight, develop a solution, I don't know, a couple hundred dollars or whatever. But if you file it in 10 countries, you know, some of which are the U.S. and, you know, Europe and Australia, all of a sudden it's like 5,000, 10,000, like the costs on the front end are so high that you're not really going to be able to do that to protect your investment, um, which again, it kills innovation, but, but it's just a, you know, one of the inequ inequities or uh, issues with, with global innovation. That's very, uh, that's a very real and insightful perspective, I'd say. Um, and very different from what we actually think, uh, considering from, you know, looking from the perspective of Pakistan and other countries. So it's very different what we can actually observe and what you're uh, relating to. Well, I, and Thank I'm you. happy to be wrong. I, I have no, no idea. No, no, no. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's certainly not about being right or wrong. I just wanted to have an yeah. idea of the perspective from where you come from. And it's even good for the audience who are joining us that there is a difference of opinion and perspective, you know, relating to the position we are in. So that's, right. that's a key thing.
Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And I would just say personally, right, like having a company and figure, you know, with a medical device, even though, you know, all it does is suck boogers. You know, we're having, you know, from a high income country, we're not seeking patent protection. We're not going to necessarily choose every country in the world to, to you know, scale our product, right? We have to pick and choose carefully where we can get the return on investment. What are the hurdles? You know, where are our, our consumers, those kinds of things. And so, you know, every innovator and entrepreneur has to ask that question, Um you know, and, and if you're, cho- you know, and if, if you're bootstrapping this, which most, you know, companies are doing from the beginning, you have to make a lot of hard decisions about where you can go and when. So. No, those are, those, those are, those are really interesting points. Uh, we've got another question. Let's, uh, let's go to this one. Uh, medical professionals sometimes find communicating with non-medical Partners, uh, I guess, with non-medical folks, uh, difficult. Sometimes innovators do face difficulty getting their vision across. What has Dr. Gaudi's experience been? How did he navigate it? Okay. I guess, yeah, communicating with non-medical folks. Do you have well, problems communicating? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the... The issue is a lot of innovators are very, very, very in the weeds because they are experts at emergency medicine, at nursing, at ear, nose, and throat of babies, what have you, and creating solutions around that is important because you need to be an expert and understand it and and be able to articulate, in my opinion, a solution that's 50%, 100% better than whatever there is being used today. Sometimes you're going to get lucky and you're going to have something that's just so obvious and so much better that people will adopt it. However, in healthcare, people do things the same way a lot, you know, and, and so there's resistance to change. So being able to communicate from an expert level to a diverse audience and educate them in a very short period of time, right? So TikTok is the the attention span of the world now, 15 seconds or less. Grab their attention, demonstrate the problem, lead them to the solution, probably provide them with a competitive matrix as to why your solution addresses their unmet needs in a way in which they will consider changing. And doing that in 15 seconds or 10 slides in a convincing way isn't a skill that most of us have. Most of us have gotten where we are by being the world expert on cleaning earwax, suctioning boogers, what have you. And we get very into the weeds and detailed about it and most people don't really want all that detail they want to hear what the problem is they want to understand or acknowledge that this is a solution that makes their lives better and convinces them to either invest money in it if it's you know if it makes sense and there's a big market for it um, or buy it and so i think that's the issue And, and again it's a it's about surrounding yourself with the right people if you are incapable or un willing to break it down into very simple, understandable kind of pieces of data that don't require, you know, a thousand words on a slide, then find somebody that can, right? So you're probably not the CEO of the company. You're the chief chief technical officer, chief medical officer, what a chief nursing, whatever you are, that's you're the key opinion leader. You're the one that brings the expertise. You need somebody else who can bring the audience along to anticipate what your next slide is going to say and and feel passionate about the the topic that you're that you're talking about. So yeah, I, I would say that I'm not I, I'm better at it now than I was, but it, it really takes a lot of practice. 
And again, none of this is taught in nursing school or uh, medical school or whatever school you're in, unless it's business school or something like that. It's just not part of the, you know, we're, we're, de we're taught to, to go very deep and very narrow. Whereas most of these communications are, should be more like Ted talks, inspiring and clear and transformative. Yeah, brilliant, uh, brilliant answer. I, I completely, uh, I completely get it. And so I'm, I'm guilty of like because I went to grad school, so you focus so much on your PhD work. I think in the current iteration of things are in innovation entrepreneurship, I don't think a PhD is going to get me uh, to kind of go across that uh, trajectory of innovation and entrepreneurship. At least not the same way. I don't think so. Um, would I do things differently now? And if I wanted to be an innovative entrepreneur, then would I pursue a PhD in biomedical science uh, without really knowing much about tech transfer commercialization? Because I, I can spend five years and get a PhD in molecular genetics, which I did in molecular and human genetics, but I had such understanding about like, okay, so if something interesting is going to be coming out of my PhD, then I should be thinking about a startup for commercializing that or patenting something, right? So I wasn't taught that, and I was a Baylor graduate student. So um, I guess things have really changed from then. And it's like I'm kind of carbon dating myself here as well. But but it's it's fascinating, you know, the, the, when you talk about these things, and how would I um, advise students? I had a student who came to me last last week only, and is interested in innovation, entrepreneurship, fourth year medical student. So you know, it kind of gets me to think as well, right? What I recommend or what I suggest to a student to pursue a PhD or a master's um, and get really focused on a specific aspect. Somebody's interested in stem cells, for example, or regenerative medicine. Would that be the way to go or if they're really thinking about startups and should they be then pursuing an MBA after getting their MD? So I I, I, I don't know. I, I, I get a bit concerned at times myself. I mean, what should I be telling somebody? And change somebody's trajectory, right? So, and they just, imposter syndrome as well. So anyway, I don't know, that makes sense. But, but th yeah. this is this has been really interesting. Um, so I don't see any more questions, but, but, but I was just, you know, I wanted to go to an earlier point. I was thinking about this. So you've done a lot of mission work and you've gone to, gone to different countries and you've done um, cleft lip and cleft palate surgeries. So what, what does it feel like? Why do you do that? What's your, what's your motivation and, um, is it just left lip, left palate, or is that something that you really enjoy doing, or just because in low middle income countries, perhaps because of consanguinity, you see a lot of those kinds of issues? Yeah, I don't, again, to get back to your point earlier, what? how should you counsel people? I think uh, my approach is having people think about kind of what their icky guy is. So I don't know, if, you know, how many people are familiar with that term, but that's right. It's like, what are you Very good at doing? Familiar. Yeah. What are you good at doing? What does the world need? Um, you know, what are they willing to pay for? Uh, and what makes you happy? And, and so figuring that out and people, you know, you may not know exactly um, what it is, but continuing to continuing to iterate on that for yourself and asking yourself, you know, those yes, no, or maybe questions, and then figuring out kind of from that per lens or perspective, what can you change or what do you have control over and what what's important to you, right? And, and so over my life, when I was a resident uh, many, many years ago, carbon dating myself before the turn of the century, uh, I was going on mission trips because I like to be abroad. I like to see different perspectives. Uh, you know, I taught English in Ethiopia one summer. I, you know, so I, that's just a, something I like to do. Um, and, and if you like to do something, there's no shame in that. Uh, there's a book uh, by Ben Hartley called 10 X is better than two X or something like that. So look at that. So you really just tuck into what is it that you really want to do? You shouldn't be ashamed of that. And so I really like to go to different places. I like to add value or create value that's just transferred to other people, particularly children, because that is 
is my icky guy. Uh, and surgery was a very obvious way for me to do that and has been for the last 20 years uh, as it relates to cleft lip and palate. And I have a research lab uh, in NIH grants that focus on tissue regeneration. And so my one of my life goals, so one of the things I want to do before I leave the planet is to develop a regenerative solution for these kids. A am I gonna be able to cure cleft lip and palate? No. I, I know that. That's not my goal. That's not what I'm good at. I'm good at surgery and I'm good at science and I'm going to marry those two or I have married those two. And so right now my lab is working on tissue regeneration using drug delivery and microbiome delivery and then bone regeneration doing some high put, you know, high throughput screening of potential bone regenerative targets. And so yeah, I mean, it's really, again, focusing on the icky guy of like, what am I good at? How can I uh, impact this? And, and realizing that a lot of what I'm doing is going to fail, but can I find something that doesn't fail, right? And and that I know I'm the best person to know what these kids need and what what the world needs, you know, to make to make these children's lives better, easier, less painful. So that's how I, I mean, it's kind of a weird mix of like, how do you go from, going to the Philippines or Guatemala to do surgery and, you know, your icky guy. But to me, it kind of lines up and I, you know, I choose to do or not do things based on those, those guiding principles uh, in my life. That, that's a, that's fascinating. And so it resonates so well with me and, and my innovation team as well, because um, we, we do delve into Ikigai, we delve into stoicism, contemporary stoicism, what's in your control, locus of control, and so on and so forth. Chapter 10 of Medjack is um, all of those, including Ikigai, and how is that relevant to uh, modern day innovation entrepreneurship, believe it or not, right? So we kind of like can try Perfect. to kind of connect all of these things. And it's been fascinating, right? Just kind of thinking about, okay, what what is your Ikigai and why do you do what you do? Um, and so... Um, Thank you for that. Um, I uh, what I, I guess as 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 perhaps a wrap up, and we we're coming up towards uh, the end of this hour. So, if there are like people, positions um, who are who are really interested or passionate about innovation and entrepreneurship, but they feel um, constrained by time and resources, um, could be a surgeon, could be student who's interested in surgery, but also wants to innovate in the entrepreneurial. Um, now that constraint could be real or could be perceived, but like, how, how do you how do you overcome that uh, resistance? And it might be just an internal thing, but how does it work for you? Because you're doing all of these different things as well. Yeah, I I mean, and I would say that uh, being an entrepreneur is also an 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 entrepreneurial journey of your life, right? It's like I've done, you're trying a lot of things that you know don't work. Um, if you are an entrepreneur, I don't think you'll ever stop thinking about the problems and, and certainly just writing them down. A lot of these problems, you know, like the nasal suction thing that we created. I mean, people, the people have been using terrible nasal suction devices for a very long time. And so it may not be the right, you know, if you are having a baby or just had a baby, it may not be the right time to like do that, but, you know, write down the problems. You, when I'm in clinic seeing patients, I am constantly doing customer discovery. Like every, every moment of the day I'm finding about, ah, well tell me, okay, well, what nasal suction device do you use or what kind of this do you have? Or, you know, why did you choose X, X, Y, and Z? Because that is, that's where you identify the problems. And those are the people that you're best, best able to serve. And you're the most convincing for them to change their minds about whatever they have, because you understand them, you're speaking to them. Um, uh, what is the guy's name? The, it's uh, the Purple Cow book, and the, there's a couple other books by him. It's Seth Godin, I think, is his name, who's an amazing marketer. And so, thinking, you know, Bill, if if you don't have the time, right? You're like, okay, I can't do this now. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. My kids are driving me crazy whatever, you know, build up your skills, right? Like watch podcasts, listen, you know, I listen to a bunch of podcasts, 
I read books about marketing all the time, you know, because really having people change their minds to advocate for the, the whatever the breakthrough that you're creating is, is the only way that it's ever going to see the light of day. So you can do a lot of skill building, even if it's not the right moment in time of your life, because you won't ever stop. This is something, you know, you were born with this itch or this genetic difference that means that you have to iterate, that you have to want to see the world in a different way. And then just figure out where where you fit in that ecosystem to bring value uh, and start building your network, right? So networking, skill building, all of those things are, are great things to do before you actually jump off the cliff uh, into the deep waters of the unknown. Yeah, but at some point you just have to say, okay, well, I would say the one thing that people need to watch out for is perfect, you know, you know, uh, perfect is the enemy of good and, and whatever you're doing will never be perfect. And if you don't try it and fail or try it and pivot, then, it, you know, you're going to die with a, a very long list of things that you wanted to make better. Let that sink in. Uh, yeah. Uh, brilliant. Uh, great. Um, great ways, great words. Um, and um, yeah, I don't I don't know what else to say. Um, thank you. I think that was a great wrap up as well because um, normally we, we, we do request the, our speaker to kind of um, leave a message for our uh, students, medical students, nursing students, other kinds of students. We're all students, we're all learners, but, but I think that's brilliant. Thank you so much. And um, for those of us in, in this time zone, it's, it's, it's Friday night. Friday night, co party. <laughs> I'm post call. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, it's it's morning for you. It's Thanksgiving over there. Thanksgiving, happy Thanksgiving to Steve Thank you. and to everybody else over here. And um, is it okay, Steve? Like, so if uh, students or uh, people get in touch with us, uh, they want to reach out yeah. to you. Is it okay if we just Absolutely. connect them to you? Okay. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Excellent. No, that's great. Fabulous. And yeah. uh, let's, well, yeah, let's maybe sometime. Keep yeah, maybe sometime I'll come and visit you guys in person. Oh, excellent! That'll be that'll be fabulous, right? That's so great. you know where we are. Uh, yeah, and do 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 uh, do make a trip to to Karachi to Pakistan. And um, thank you, folks. Uh, we've got some really uh, good thank you comments over here as well. Very inspiring. Thank you so much for this conversation. Completely in sync with that. And um, yes, maybe Steve, like we could because my innovation team and uh, other people over here on this call. We'd love to kind of keep working with you on on maybe uh, yeah. some iteration of the Innovation Fellowship. People that you have in your certification program, they want to learn about some aspects of design thinking through Jugard means. Jugard innovation is low tech and low fidelity ways of doing these things as well. Anyways, a lot that we could also offer uh, as part Great. of this process. Great. So thank you and good night to all. Thank you, Eamon. Uh, over to you. Over to Eamon, by the way. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Asad, and thank you so much, Dr. Stephen. It was a great, insightful conversation. Uh, there were a lot of synergies, and at the end, I just give a small uh, statement that certainly uh, entrepreneurial mindset has certain reflective points in life where, where all of the, them saying despite wherever they're located on the globe. So th there was a lot of synergy and it's it's beautiful how it's all coming together. Um, thank you so much for your time and for your uh, insightful conversation with us and looking forward to something more inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thank you.